something like that. All right. And then straight to the rock. And then how you conclude in your discussion or with your supervisor or with your reading and so on, whatever it is. Uh, that that is the signaling uh, pathway involved right, to conclude kind of whatever it is because when normally when we are dealing with a pathway you know it's a series of another proteins you know it's a uh, upper and up up like you know <laughs> what, 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 what is your comment on that on that uh, thank you for the concern and questions uh mm. so that can you hear me right okay yeah uh, so Clearly. actually this uh this result that I presented today is a part of the uh, my whole project. So there is a lot more protein that I look at, which is the um, upstream effect of rock and downstream substrate of rock. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. uh, so we are so here in this presentation. So I focus on row A, B, C, and rock one only for the meantime. Only one, yeah. Uh, so uh, because yeah. it is um, row A, B, C is one of the main regulator of rock. And one is the main um, protein that was affected due to increase in tissue rigidity. Yeah, because uh, my, because uh, you know we always when we uh, when you are presenting whatever it is, I always with the objective and also with the conclusion. So that's why that's why my my question is is a concern <laughs> about you know, the things. Okay, yeah. nice, nice to know that you also working on upstream and downstream all the things to conclude maybe for your thesis or your you are doing PhD. I ah, yeah, I'm doing PhD. Okay. So I think okay okay let's just see too. Pasti. Uh, I have a basic question. Uh, just now you hypothesized or probably this has been reported that uh tissue rigidity increase uh gene expression of this rock. Yeah. Uh, uh is there any possibility that is the opposite rock? Uh, higher expression of drop cause the tissue rigidity. Uh, the, uh sorry, for, uh, it's meaning that increased tissue rigidity drop. Uh, can uh, I, I didn't get the rock question, level. Sorry. Uh -huh. Increase <laughs> drop level. Uh, okay. cause tissue rigidity instead of rigidity cause. Ah, higher, okay. Uh, so it's the like uh, which one comes first, chicken or egg, right? So uh, um, it's concurrent actually, but uh, we are focusing more on the we, uh, from the literature first. We found that one that come uh, effective first is tissue rigidity, and then rock. So actually, uh, from my previous uh, reading, there is also a study that found that both is a concurrent event in the cancer progression so they are like a positive feedback mechanism that uh, that um, keep in increasing in the promoting of cancer growth yeah uh, just now just want to clarify maybe uh, i missed the slide uh, just now you show higher protein uh, from western blood yeah. Uh, from your QPCR, the level was also higher or did not show significantly uh, higher level? Did not show significantly did higher. Not. Uh, so uh, very quick, uh, uh, how would you explain that kind uh, of result? Yeah, it's maybe because of, um, so mRNA is something that was, uh, you know, uh, very tedious to handle. But, I think that our mRNA is fine due to the post PCR analysis and so on. Maybe this is due to the post translational um, effect that was because sometimes uh, the mRNA expression is higher but not in protein. So it's not always the mRNA expression and protein expression does not always come um, like a similar expression. Uh, so we think that it's maybe due to the post translational effect also on. Alright, uh, that's all. Okay. Okay. Thank you for for and Dr. for the questions.
Okay, thank you and well done, our first presenter. Next, I shall pass the baton to our second presenter. Uh, if the put M12, Zaida Zakaria, to present her research type entitled b bread Improve Hepatic Lipid Metabolism in High-Fat Diet Induced Obesity and Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease by modulating SIRT1 AMPK SREB P1C signaling. Okay, please. My name is Zaida Zakaria. I would like to present my study entitled Bebrat Improves Hepatic Lipid Metabolism in High-Fat Diet Induced Obesity and Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease by Medulatin SIRT1 AMPK SREBP1C signaling. So this is my study outline. Obesity is becoming prevalent in developed and developing countries and is considered significant risk factors for chronic diseases for example, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, osteoarthritis, some cancers, diabetes, and liver diseases. And AFLD is characterized by an excessive accumulation of more than 5% fat in the hepatocytes. It comprises a spectrum of histological findings that range from simple statuses, cetohepatitis, cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and liver-related mortality. Hepatic lipid metabolism involves a few important mechanisms such as fatty acid uptake, de novo lipogenesis, fatty acid oxidation, lipoprotein synthesis and export, and hepatic lipolysis. SIRT1 so is an important modulator of energy metabolism which regulates all these mechanisms. SIRT1 so activates LKB1 which later will activate AMPK activation. The activation of this AMPK will inhibit SREBP1C, which finally will suppress fatty acid synthesis. This AMPK also activates CPT1, which finally will stimulate fatty acid oxidation. Bibrat is a B product used traditionally to maintain and improve general health and liver function. It is made up from a mixture of bee pollen, honey, and its digestive enzymes, which stored in beehive. The end Arabic lactic acid fermentation process takes place, contributes to greater nutritive value of bee bread. It has antioxidant, antibacterial, anti-cancer, and anti-obesity properties. Previous studies have found Malaysian bee bread contains carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, flavonoids, phenols, as well as antioxidant activity. So previous studies have shown that administration of bee bread significantly reduces body weight, hyperlipidemia, testicular, renal, and aortic oxidative stress markers. However, to date, it is not known whether bee bread may also improve hepatic lipid metabolism in high-fat diet induced obese and NAFLD rats and the possible mechanism involved. Therefore, the objective of this study was to investigate the effects of bee bread on hepatic lipid metabolism and SIRT1 AMPK SREBP1C signaling in hepatic diet induced obese and NAFLD rats. The specific objective for this study were to determine the effects of bee bread on body weight gain, BMI, food intake, calorie intake, liver function test, serum lipid profile, liver lipid content, SIRT1, AMPK, SREBP1C, CPT1, and NAFLD activity score in high-fat diet induced obese and NAFLD rats. This is the study flowchart. 24 of adult male spread dolly rats were divided into four groups, which were norm the normal group, high-fat diet group, high-fat diet plus b bread group, high-fat diet plus holistic group. So food intake and body weight were measured daily and weekly, respectively. After 12 weeks, all rats were anesthetized and sacrificed to assess all these parameters listed here. 
This is the statistical analysis used in this study. This study demonstrated significant increase in body weight gain and body mass index in high fat diet group compared to normal group, whereas intake of B bread significantly reduced all these parameters. And these findings support the previous studies which reported the anti obesity effect of B bread. We also found significant increase in calorie intake in all high fat diet groups compared to normal. So this might be due to the higher fat composition in our high fat diet regime, which consisted of 31% fat compared to, to only 12% fat in normal diet. This table showing the serum liver and lipid profiles. The study demonstrated significant increase in levels of liver enzymes in high fat diet group compared to normal group. Whereas intake of B bread significantly reduced this level of liver enzymes. The increase of these liver enzymes in the high fat diet group is suggestive of liver injury in this group. Decrease in this level of liver enzymes after B bread administration, indicating that B bread has hepatoprotective effect against liver injury, which is in agreement with the published reports. We also found significant decreased level of HDL as well as significant increased level of LDL, triglyceride, and total cholesterol levels in high fat diet group compared to normal group, whereas administration of B bread significantly reverses all these parameters. So hyperlipidemia is related to abnormalities in hepatic lipid metabolism. Administration of B bread able to ameliorate hyperlipidemia in the hepatic diet induced obese and NAFL directs, which support the previous reported studies. This figure showing liver lipid content, we found significant increased triglyceride, total cholesterol, and free fatty acid levels in high fat diet group compared to normal group, whereas intake of B bread significantly reduced all these parameters. Increased levels of liver lipid content indicate increased hepatic lipid synthesis and lipogenesis, which are an important index for the development of hepatic lipid metabolism disorder. And decreased levels of these parameters after intake of B bread for 12 weeks demonstrated the anti lipogenic effect of B bread in improving hepatic lipid metabolism. This figure showing the liver SIR1 and PK protein levels and CPT, SRE, BP1C, and RNA levels. This finding demonstrated significant decreased levels of SIR1 and AMPK protein, CPT1, mRNA expression, as well as increased SRE, BP1C, mRNA expression in high fat diet group compared to normal group. Whereas intake of B bread reverses all these parameters. So these results show that intake of B bread able to reduce fatty acid synthesis and increase fatty acid oxidation by its action on SIR1, AMPK, SRE, BP1C signaling pathway. So this figure showing the NAFD activity score, our study demonstrated significant increase. Uh, and, and NAFLD activity score in high fat diet group compared to normal group, whereas intake of B bread significantly reduced this NAS score compared to high fat diet group. The photomicrographs of liver also shows a uh, normal liver architecture in normal group, whereas uh, we we found uh, more fat deposition in high fat diet group. And the intake of B bread and also olistat reduce the fat deposition in the liver tissue. So this histopathological finding supports the beneficial effects of B bread in providing protection against NAFLD. To summarize and conclude this presentation, B bread at 0.5 gram per kilogram per day for 12 weeks ameliorates obesity, liver injury, hyperlipidemia, and hepatic cetosis by suppressing SRE BP1C related lipogenesis and promoting fatty acid oxidation via regulating SIR1 AMPK pathway, hence improves hepatic lipid metabolism. 
This may suggest that BBRAP offers some protective effects against obesity and NAF NAFLD. These beneficial effects are probably through the action of phenylic compounds present in BBRAP, which have anti-obesity, hepatoprotective, antioxidant, and anti-inflammatory properties. However, it is suggested to further study its possible beneficial effects in other pathways of hepatic lipid metabolism, such as fatty acid uptake and lipolysis. This is my acknowledgement and some references used in this presentation. With that, thank you. Okay, thank you, presenter. Uh, you may now turn on your microphone and camera, and we will proceed with the Q&A session. So over the judges. Okay. I ask a question first. Uh, here, you compare between B bread and only start. Uh, what is the, the source of your B bread? The source of B bread, actually we... Um... We take the bee bread from local uh, bee farm actually, and then we process, uh, we harvested from that local bee farm, we process, we dry, and then we ground and uh, grinded that bee bread. Okay, uh, so uh, the question is if you change the source of bee bread, uh, do you expect uh, that the effect will be different? Change the source, or oh, you mean the habitat and the surrounding? Is it uh, from... either the habitat or just the source? That means if you get this time, you get it from the local farm. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe next time you get it from uh, another farm. Actually, uh, I found uh, studies that compare between the different geographical uh, areas and then. There are some differences between the total phenolic, phenolic compound, the antioxidant and everything. So actually, um, that will be my, uh, actually I'm going to do that, that, that study in, uh, in, few, uh, in future, this, uh, in few months uh, later, because I want to see whether the geographical uh, difference, maybe the, lo the location uh, in terms of the species of uh, flowers, everything will affect the you know, the uh, the uh, compound inside the bee breath itself, actually. So, uh, there, there okay. are studies, actually. But, uh -huh. but, but there are no studies uh, until now that use these different types of bee breath dif from different sources. So, there are no, no studies yet, uh, currently. Right. I, I move to my next question. Uh, only start, you compare with the effect of only start. Uh, what yes. is Olistat actually? It's a drug or? Yes, it's a drug. It's a conventional drug which uh, okay. usually prescribed by clinician to treat uh, okay. uh, antibiotic. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, your your results shows uh, in certain cases <laughs> it's better than Olistat. So then my question is, which one is more expensive or is start of <laughs> actually if you go to uh nearest pharmacy uh or start is sorry i, I heard some background okay yes okay, okay. proceed okay Easily, it actually if you go to nearest pharmacies this only start uh, can be found easily uh on one strip which um and consists consisted of I think I think twelve twelve um tablets or something I, I can't remember. It costs not that 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 expensive. So you can easily take without um this all this stuff itself is it can easily be found. Not not necessary prescribed by the by the doctor. But here this um this beer bread you cannot just purchase anywhere around around the local market or everything because uh, it's not compared to honey actually if we compare to honey you can just easily go to uh, you know local market and then you can you can find many types of honey tualang honey kelulut honey everything right okay right. but this this beer bread you cannot just easily found it so you need to uh. go to that certain area which uh, like the bee farm so you need request to them 
but this is what we are trying to do to make it to be bright to make it be bright more familiarized uh, you know because some people they don't even know this be bright what is be bright actually they just know oh i know honey is it be bright the same as honey or it come out from from the same same part of honey or what what is it so we want to make it familiarized we want to make it well known this be bright has also has right. high potential actually so you can if you want compare to all this that name be bright so i don't know maybe we can it's, we cannot compare it's okay it's one. okay huh? it's good that you you are aware of these things uh, so okay. let's continue with another question uh, uh, as as Assalamualaikum Zaida. okay so when you are doing this i follow your your discussion with the uh, doctor dr to c2 thing whatever it is and at, at the end of the study normally you're going to like reflect to to application on the human kind something like that yes. am i right mm -hmm. that is what we're doing you know honey be bread whatever it is thing whatever it is uh my question okay? basic question okay, basic question i'm sorry to interrupt dr ridwan yeah because actually we have come to the end of our five minutes q and e session is already a seat can i <laughs> yeah can I... you want to still to us okay can i have a straight, uh, straight question uh? okay, I, I need i need one question like that uh is it any 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 what you call it um relationship any relation okay whatever it is between the gallbladder and the lipid absorptions gallbladder and lipid absorption it's related actually related, related. Okay. yes related okay. to the point of the questions do you know uh -huh. that the red model uh -huh. using is no gallbladder the gallbladder also usually usually human is gallbladder no the red the red, the, the, the red scan. You're using the red kind as a as a yes. as this model kind. Yes. Do you yes. know that and not and not comically, the uh -huh. red has no gallbladder. This is um you need to look into the anatomy of the God, red. something like that. So <laughs> I'm afraid that within your vibe or something like that or for your conclusion later on, how are you going to justify that? Okay, no? Is that <laughs> I pass to the. I passed to the. I passed to the. Uh, Thank the, you, Prof. I uh, said, so, okay, sketch it. Okay. Look that now, Zaida. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think uh, that's all for QA. Uh, five minutes. Wait, uh, wait, uh, let me remind all of you again. We only have five minutes for the QA session. So hopefully, we not exceed for each. Uh, time provided for each presenter <laughs> okay so next uh, we will have our third presenter uh, with the code m26 siti nur nabila aifah binti muhammad to present her research entitled detections of b globin gene cluster mutation among patients with high fetal hemoglobin in hospital university science malaysia so yeah, i see this thing with you group that exists in the country. 8,681 as a thalassemia pressure register with the Malaysia Thalassemia Registry in 2018. My name is Siti Nabila Aifa Mindi Muhammad from USM. Today, I want to share about detection of beta globin gene cluster mutation among patients with high fetal hemoglobin or known as HBF in Hospital University Science Malaysia. Beta globin gene cluster are located at the chromosome 11 and arranged with the five functional genes as shown in the schematic diagram. These functional genes are used to express the different type of hemoglobin with their own change and normal percentage, such as like HBA2, HPF and also HPA. The defection of the beta globin gene cluster or alteration will lead to the mutation beta globin gene cluster, such as like beta thalassemia, delta beta thalassemia, hereditary persistent of beta hemoglobin, or known as the HPFH. This situation will lead to the influence of HPF level. HBF consists of the alpha and also the gamma globin. It will occur the shifting process to shift the HBF to the adult 
HB with the less than 1% in the normal adult. But it can be increased due to the persistence of gamma globin production. And increase of the gamma globin production are offered by the delay of shifting process. This uh, will occur because of two factors, which is inherited and also the acquired causes. That situation are related with the decline of the hemoglobin in the blood, or known as the anemia. Table to show the range of the hemoglobin for the normal and anemic section for the both gender. This is the causes of anemia, which is slightly same with the high HPF level, which is inherited and also the acquired. So, uh, this is the objective by, uh, by the general and specific. For the general, to detect the beta globin gene cluster among the enemy patient with the high HPF. Why for the specific, we have two objectives, which is to detect high HPF among enemy patient and we elucidate beta globin gene cluster mutation among the anemic patient with the high HPF. Okay, next we move on to the flow chart of research. So start with the collect blood sample at the HUSM and full blood count for the detect the anemic patient and hemoglobin analysis using the HPLC. Both um, step is uh, important for continue the molecular diagnosis, which is the DNA extraction and also the PCR. So in the PCR, we have two PCR by using the conventional PCR, which is the arm PCR and also the gap PCR. So we will detect the presence or absence of mutation in the beta globin gene. After that, we go to the data analysis. We proceed with the criteria sample selection. So we have two uh, main criteria, which is the inclusion and also exclusion criteria. So to determine this uh, criteria, we need to determine the level of hemoglobin and also HBF and HBA2. So for the hemoglobin, uh, we need the patient which is more than one year old. So we have 140 anemia patients. So for the HPF level, high HPF, we use the HPLC. So from this, we got 60 anemia patients with high HPF. Okay, we proceed to the DNA extraction by using the kit. So we have four um, main steps. So uh, this step, uh, we will use to filter the unwanted material at this uh, step and to remove the contaminant. So we can collect the DNA sample for the further diagnosis. Before we proceed to the PCR, we must assess the concentration of DNA and also purity. So we will use the nanodrop. So uh, the concentration and the purity are important to get the appropriate result in the post-PCR. So in the PCR, we have to type PCR to detect the deletion or mutation. So this is the mutation for the arms uh, PCR and this is the mutation for the GAP PCR. And basically, we choose uh, based on previous prevalent of beta globin gene cluster in Malaysia. Next is the scientific discovery show the gender are high in the male and the ethnicity are high in the Malay for the high HPF patient. So um, what I would like to highlight in this screen is the hematological profile show all the patients are anemic because the hemoglobin are lower at the mean. So the HPF is high and similar to the HBA2. So the decrease in the MCV and also the MCH on 47 patients. So basically the decrease of both uh, in this 
and increase the HBF can be applied as a consider to thalassemia patient. However, it can be present as a asymptomatic and different severity of anemia, either in the mild, moderate, and also severe. So we proceed to the post result of PCR. So for the figure A and B show for the arms PCR, while for the C is cat PCR. For all figure show the internal control so that the sample is okay. And then uh, there is uh, a few mutation here, which is CD26, CD4142, IVS15, and also CD89 at the arms PCR. Why for the cat PCR, there is no mutation here, but it, have, it also has the internal control. Okay, next slide show the frequency of beta globulin cluster by arms PCR. So basically, for uh, mutation is CD26 uh, high in the number of patients, which is 19 patients, and followed by the IVS15, CD4142, and CD89. So there is no mutation detected by the GAT PCR. And this study show uh, most frequent detected in CD26 and IVS15 are Malay patient. So uh, interestingly, our results CD41 and 42 show in the Malay uh, patient are similar with the study by Hassan et al. 2013 and also Hanafi et al. Uh, 2014. So basically, uh, the CD89 in this result show a uh, heterozygous with the CD26, but it is the rare mutation in the Malay patient. However, the CD89 mainly exists in the Indian ethnic city, which is included in our Malaysian population. So for the CD4142 is the most common in Chinese, but it also present in the Malay patient. So why this can be occur? So maybe it because of the consequence of the intermarriage uh, between Malay, Indian and also Chinese. So this is our conclusion. So for the conclusion, uh, we would like to emphasize the importance of molecular characterization by detect the different type of beta globin gene cluster among the anemic patient with high HDF. So basically, the molecular diagnosis is um, important for the better and the proper management of beta thalassemia in our country and other country. So this is our reference. And thank you for watching. Okay, thank you presenter. But I'm sorry judges, we were informed that the participants M26 cannot uh, make it to our Q&A session. And without further any delay, I would like to call upon our fourth presenter, M29, BB Nur Bazlini Baharun, to present her research entitled The Role of Microphages Derived Interleukin 6 and Its Effects on Lymphovascular Invasions of Breast Carcinoma. Yeah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to all of the judges. My name is Bibi Nobazlini Baharun from USM and today I will present my research entitled The Role of Macrophage Derived Interleukins and Its Effect on Lymphovascular Invasion of Breast Carcinoma. Breast carcinoma is one of the leading causes of cancer morbidity and mortality for women globally. 
breast cancer impacting 2.1 million women each year, which approximately 50% of all cancer deaths among women. In Malaysia, every 1 in 20 women are facing high risk in developing breast cancer, with the highest population are in Chinese, followed by Indian and lastly Malay per 100,000 of Malaysian population. The most feared form of cancer is when the cancer is, meta is metastasis. So what is metastasis? Metastasis refer to the spreading of malignant cells from the original location to the other part of organ or body. This figure shows us how metastasis happen in human body. Firstly, metastasis start with the proliferation of neoplastic cells take place progressively, which will cause the cell to increase in size and start to developing angiogenesis, which later will develop into primary tumor. This is primary tumor. Then, the cells start to detach itself from the primary tumor and invade into the surrounding vascular circulation with the help from the macrophage secreted cytokine. This process we call as invasion and intravasation. The tumor cell later are disseminated via the bloodstream or lymphatic vessel into the organ. At this stage, we call it as migration. Then, the tumor cell will extravasate into the organ parenchyma and settle down at the new site of the organ. Consequently, the tumor cell undergo cell cycle arrest and adhere to capillary beds with the target organ or we call as adhesion. If the tumor succeed in completing this step, the process will be repeated. As I explained before, the macrophage plays a critical role in orchestrating the tumor environment. The macrophage is differentiated originally from the monocyte, which will then later will be divided into two types of macrophage, which is M1 macrophage and M2 macrophage. M1 macrophage more prone to anti-tumor activity, while M2 macrophage is prone to pro-tumor activity. One of the cytokines that are derived by this macrophage is called interleukin-6 or IL-6. IL-6 is a pleiotropic cytokine produced by monocyte and macrophage and it is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. IL-6 influences the tumor behavior, apoptosis, tumor growth, cell proliferation, migration and invasion, angiogenesis and metastasis. Besides that, IL-6 play a part to pro-metastasis process including epithelial to mesenchymal transition, cell invasion, cell migration and mesenchymal stem cell retreatment. According to Mantovani in 2018, there are significant relationship between higher circulating level of IL-6 with more advanced stage of disease including metastasis among breast cancer patients, thus leading us to this research problem. Despite a lot of recent advances in the detection and treatment of breast cancer, the development of metastasis remains a significant problem and the main driver of mortality. The heterogeneous nature of breast cancer metastasis makes it difficult not only to define creative treatment, but also to assess risk factor of metastasis. So, what are the relationship of this problem with macrophage and IL-6? Recent study only managed to prove that there are association of IL-6 with tumor progression, but study on how IL-6 influence the metastasis and the aggressiveness of the cancer cell is still not well developed. Besides, knowledge on the origin of the IL-6 which influence the metastasis and tumor progression still need to be studied, whether IL-6 that are existing in the tumor envi microenvironment or IL-6 that are differentiated from the M1 or M2 macrophage are affecting the cancer cell behavior. The objective of my study is to examine the association of macrophage polarization and macrophage-derived IL-6 with clinical pathological criteria and lymphovascular invasion of breast carcinoma via immunohistochemical staining. This is the methodology of my study. I had obtained 130 cases of FFPE specimen of breast carcinoma sample from year 2005 to 2015, randomly collected from Pathology Department of Hospital University Science Malaysia. Among that, 31 cases were excluded due to poor sample fixation and another 80 samples were excluded due to lack of sample block stock. Total of 81 cases will proceed with this study and all of the blocks were carried out for ISC staining with four different cytokine and biomarker, which is IL-6, CD80, CD204, and CD68. 
Antibody concentration used is 1 is to 200 for IL-6, 1 is to 100 for CD-80, 1 is to 500 for CD-68, and 1 is to 1000 for CD-204. Each slide of IL-6 staining will assess it depending on the biomarker. For IL-6 cytokine, we are using his core method, which the overall staining was divided by the percentage into no staining, weak staining, moderate staining, and strong staining, then calculated the score using formula shown in this figure. Meanwhile, for the CD80, CD204, and CD68 biomarker, the macrophage count were evaluated on intra- and peritumoral area. Macrophage density was assessed in the three most vascular area or hotspot following a brief scan of entire slide. Three hotspots of positively steam cell were counted across the section using an eyepiece mounted 25 point chalky array reticle. The median of the three chalky count was used for the subsequent statistical analysis. The relationship between marker versus clinical pathological data of patient and LVI parameter were carried out using Pearson chi-square test of association and p-value less than 0.05 was considered significant. The ethical approval for this study was granted by the Human Research Ethics Committee of USM. We proceed to the result and discussion. Table 1 shows the clinical data of 81 patients. Majority of the patients each are 40 and above with Malay as the dominant ethnicity among all patients. The tumor size detected was between 20 mm to 15 mm, with majority of the tumor grade was at grade 3. Limb node involvement in breast cancer metastasis is positive with the hormone receptor ERPR and HER2 Majority leaning to the positive side, while TMBC status is leaning more to the negative side. Lastly, the breast cancer recurrent among patients is more on the negative side. The picture shown is the positive staining cytoplasm of the IL-6 and CD-80 macrophage when viewed under 14 light microscope. Meanwhile, this figure shows the positive staining of cytoplasm of the CD-68 and CD-204. The arrow in the figure showed the positive staining of the macrophage when viewed under 100 magnification with light microscope. Figure showed the histogram distribution of each biomarker. All of the data are normally distributed except for CD68 and CD204 which is slightly skewed. Table 2 showed the median for all of the biomarker and cytokine. And Table 3 showed the association between IL-6, CD-80, CD-68 and CD-204. CD-68 is the only biomarker that showed the significant association with CD-204, meaning that both biomarkers stain a similar subset of M2 macrophage. There is a definite possibility of a significant association of IL-6 with M2 macrophage that contributing to breast cancer metastasis with a bigger sample size, which makes it worthwhile to proceed investigating IL-6 in this study. Unfortunately, there are no significant association of IL-6 cytokine with the patient clinical pathological data, but it is also maybe due to the small sample number of sample size. Meanwhile, there are significant association of CD80 with the patient tumor growth, ER, and PR receptor. CD204 also shows significant association with ER and PR receptor of patient clinical data. Significant association of ER and PR receptor show that CD80 and CD204 have association with higher expression of proliferation-related gene in the breast cancer patient, which will increase the risk of micrometastasis, especially in the lymph node. In the last decade, tumor size and lymph node status have been used as the main factor for the selection of suitable treatment in breast carcinoma. Previous studies show that positive node with increased size of tumor was associated with decreased survival rate. The classification of tumor biological subtype by the ERPR and HER2 biomarker in ISD are proved to be useful for deciding therapeutic strategy in clinical management among breast cancer patients. For the CD68, there are significant association of metastasis status and LVI with the patient clinical pathological data. 
There are several studies shows that CD68 in tumor cell metastasis and slightly worsen the relapse survival and overall survival. As metastasis status is highly associated with LVI or lymphovascular invasion, we could say that CD68 could contribute to distant metastasis of breast carcinoma. Besides that, CD68 also correlates with worse prognosis in breast cancer patients. Significant association of LVI show that CD68 have association with the increase in tumor invasion into the lymphatic vessel. Although there is no significant association between ILC and LVI, but a study shows that IL6 to be a positive prognosticator for overall survival and disease-free survival in the earlier stage of breast cancer, which means that in the advanced stage, expression of IL6 and its receptor subunit predict better prognosis. In conclusion, IL-6 have high possibility in contributing to breast cancer metastasis alongside with CD204, CD80, and CD68, indicating the influence of M1 and M2 macrophage in breast cancer metastasis pathway. The current study result could straighten our understanding of the microvascular invasion and the role of IL-6 in breast carcinoma. This is my reference list. This is another reference list. That's all from me, and thank you for giving me your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, presenter. So let's welcome for you to have our five minutes Q and A session. Okay, your five minutes start now. Okay, Didi. Yes. I think. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. This is quite interesting. Okay, uh, thank you, Okay, uh, looking at your yeah, is uh, your directions is a look you are try to 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 link with the interleukin six kind of your prime target you, yes. and then with the association with the metastasis or engine and or metastatic effects of your breast cancer kind, yeah, something like that yeah. Yes. So I I think your your study too is just uh between the macrophages or macrophages and then it is obvious that the the pathway is the link of the macrophages too kind. Uh, and quite, like, yes, uh, for now, yes. Nampak dia, dia leading ke, ke arah itu, think, something like that. My okay. question kat sini, ataupun my question, my question kat sini, ada okay. tak you punya, you punya what you call it, uh, uh, considerations mm -hmm. to looking to looking at things, another markers that that uh, strictly ataupun focus kepada, is a focus to the angiogenesis or metastatic punya, uh, punya marker, biomarker. Like, like uh, VG, VG, VEGF or something like that or other CDs that are related to the angiogenesis? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we are planning it as uh, as my future study. As okay. all, uh, uh, We are using uh, animal model to mm -hmm. see the, uh, we are using a uh, different biomarker such as uh, ICAM for the uh, ad, uh, addition of the cancer cell and uh, tenacin C for the uh, prognosis of uh, metastasis. Okay. And uh, also, um, uh, laminin gamma. That's Lemin for gamma. Uh, migration but um, biomarker for the migration of cancer cell. VGF not include included. Uh, VGF uh had already uh now is being done by uh, another uh, postgraduate student you know, in our VGF. research group. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, bro. I'll pass to C two. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested with uh, a conclusion or somewhere in the result discussion there, where okay. you mentioned uh, that is a definite possibility of significant association mm -hmm. uh, between macrophage contributing. Uh, however, your result did not show significant association of IL-6. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, and then you you say that if you use larger sample size, uh -huh. you you should see the association. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because uh, if you see at the uh, um, our my uh, first result, you can see the gap uh, for the IL six with uh, the significant gap for IL six uh, is quite small. It's it's just a small gap. So if I could uh, add my uh, sample size, so the 
I will definitely achieve the significant uh, level of IELTS. Uh, I, I feel like it's quite strange because you like you are trying to achieve a significant oh, something instead oh, okay, of just okay. accepting the result. So okay, that's okay, why I, I get it. Yeah, okay, that's okay, why okay, I, okay. I, I think uh, normally we don't make this kind of, of, of conclusion saying that you try to get the significant or the predicted or the expected result. Yeah. Oh, uh, because uh, what I want to say is, uh, because what I want to show is that uh, IELTS is still uh, is still uh, influence the metastasis of the breast cancer cell, but maybe in the micro metastasis stage, even if we don't see we don't see micro metastasis stage in the initial stage of metastasis. So maybe uh, what I'm saying is maybe if we block the IELTS in the initial stage, so. Uh, Naturally, it will uh, produce a better prognosis for uh, breast cancer, carcinoma patient. Okay, thank you. Maybe. Okay. My, my, thank my, you. My, that's what my last response is that you have one word. Okay. No result, it's a result no? after this. No? Okay, thank you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well done, presenter. Okay, well done and thank you, presenter. So now let's welcome our board uh, presenter with the code M42, Nik Nur Hakimah Nik Abdullah, to present her research, her research entitled Evaluations of Bay Clean and Rich Fraction Preconditioned Neural Stem Cell Therapy for Ischemic Stroke Red Model. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and greetings to all panelists. My name is Nidnar Hakimah Binti Nid Saleh, Elias Nid Abdullah, and I am a master's student in biomedicine program mm -hmm. in University of Science Malaysia. Today, I am going to present my research entitled Evaluation of Baclin Enriched Fraction Preconditioned Neurostem Cells Therapy for Ischemic Stroke Red Model. Without further ado, let me start my presentation. Stroke, also known as the cerebrovascular accident or brain attack, is the sudden death of brain cells. There are two types of strokes, namely ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke is caused by occlusion of blood vessels causing blockage of blood flow, while hemorrhagic stroke is caused by rupture of an artery to the brain, which causes bleeding to occur within the brain. My study is focused more on ischemic stroke as it is more common in Malaysia compared to hemorrhagic stroke. Dead neurons due to stroke are unable to regenerate, which causes this disease to be very pharmacological dependent. It also has a low prognosis and high recurrent rate. Therefore, an alternative treatment is needed. For the past few years, stem cell grafting is the most encouraging approach for the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, as stem cells are a class of undifferentiated cells which has the ability to self-renew and develop into different cells. For example, the neural stem cells can develop into neuron astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. However, the turnover rate of resident neural stem cells in brain are too slow to support natural regeneration because of their dormancy. Therefore, in this study, Baclin was used to um, precondition the neural stem cells. Baclin are obtained from the oroxylum indicum plant, or locally known as the Beko plant which is widely distributed in the Southeast Asian countries, and it is also consumed as ulam, ulaman by the locals. It, has a, it is a unique plant which has a broad range of secondary metabolites such as flavonoids or alkaloids, uh, and baclin is the most abundant flavonoid in the plant. And Baclin has been reported to have neuronal protection effects on cerebral ischemia or reperfusion injury. And it has also been reported to promote neural differentiation and inhibited neuronal apoptosis. In short, 
stroke has caused permanent neuronal damage to those who are afflicted with it because the dead brain cells due to stroke are unable to regenerate. Stem cells, which has the ability to self-renew and differentiate it into major functional neuronal cells, could be a potential therapeutic agent for stroke. But the turnover rate of resident neural stem cells are too slow to support natural regeneration because of their dormancy. As a result, the neural stem cells are still unable to effectively regenerate damaged tissues to date. So this study, uh, uh, this study is focused on the therapeutic potential of neural stem cell-based treatment for ischemic stroke using baclin enriched fraction extracted from the leaves of oroxylum indicum. The methodologies are as follows. Um, the first part is the extraction and characterization of baclin active compound. First, uh, the sleeves of oroxylum indicum were collected and extracted. Uh, and then we fraction it using the column chromatography method to obtain the baclin active compound. Next, we Quantify the baclin active compound in the baclin enriched fraction using TLC and HPLC, and the standard baclin was used as a control marker. Next, we determine the optimum baclin enriched fraction treatment using the in vitro cytotoxicity assay, and it has been um, uh, it has been determined that the safest dosage for the red neural stem cell was 3.125 microgram per meal, and the treatment uh, period is for 48 hours. This is the before and after photos of the red neural stem cells. Um, it, uh, the, the cells were significantly increased in number and viability after being treated with the 3.125 microgram per mil baclin enriched fraction for 48 hours. Next, the next part is to establish the endothelin one induced ischemic stroke rat model. We had implanted the cannula assembly in rat brain to induce the rat to induce ischemic stroke on the rat model using the endothelin one injection. And we did a comprehensive observation of the stroke severity. Only, only rats with stroke severity 2 to 4 will be included in the study. This is the detailed uh, procedures of the, of the induction of the ischemic stroke rats. And we use adenatin 1 as adenatin 1 is a 21 amino acid peptide that binds to two receptor subsites, the endocrine A and B receptors in the brain, and it will constrict them. Therefore, it will cause the ischemic stroke in the rat. This is the example of the um, ischemic stroke rat's behavior. They will lose the balance of rearing and walking. They will raise the contralateral forepaw, head will turn to contralateral direction and there will be some spasmodic contralateral trillions and systematic grooming. This is the uh, this is an example of the comparison between the normal rat brains and the ischemic rat brains. The ischemic rat brains will show some edema tissues, some necrotic bodies, perivascular edema, inflammatory cells, hemorrhage, and very vascular edema in the brain. The next part is the ischemic stroke treatment using the baclin enriched fraction three condition neural stem cells. The ischemic stroke rat models were divided into three groups, which is the baclin enriched fraction three condition neural stem cell, the non pre condition neural stem cell, and the non treated group. And the last part is the neurological function test and histological examination. All three study groups were uh, assessed for the neurological function test for 14 days. And after 14 days, the rats were sacrificed and there, will be, uh, there, there were tissue structural and morphological examination done.
Um, this is uh, the graphs showing the weight loss and gain by ischemic stroke rats of different groups. The Bakelin enriched fraction preconditioned neurosome cell group showed increased body weight after seven days of the um, injection of the Bakelin enriched fraction neurosome cell group, neurosome cell. The second graph showed the differences of rotorot walking time between groups. The Bakelin enriched fraction preconditioned neurosome cell group showed significant motor skills after 24 hours. And the last graph showed the modified neurological severity score, which includes a composite of motor, sensory, reflect, and balance tests. The higher the, higher the MNS, uh, MNSS score means the severe the stroke severity. So the BEF preconditioned neurosome cell group showed restoration of MNSS score better than the control groups. In conclusion, the optimum dosage for Bakelin enriched fraction on neurosome cells is 3.1 to 5 microgram per meal for 48 hours. The improvement in stroke behaviors occurred within 14 days after the preconditioned neurosome cell transplantation, and the Bakelin enriched fraction contributed to the survivals of neurosome cells in ischemic condition and significantly improved the damaged neuronal tissue caused by stroke. These are some of my references. Thank you. So thank you, uh, presenter. So let's proceed with the Q&A sessions. So presenter, please turn on your microphone and camera. Okay, now, Akima. Yes, okay. Can can you hear me now? So during during your study, I think it's a, your your model is quite 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 difficult to handle, kind. I think is to to generate from even quite quite challenging, kind. Think whatever it is. What is the <laughs> mortality rate? Mortality rate, now? Sorry, that. The, the, motil, the motility rate of your study, the, you put your animal model. Motility rate, uh, we have uh, about 20% 20, uh, 20 drop up. Uh, so, uh, yes. 20% drop up. Huh? Because it, 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 it includes the surgery part and stuff. Okay. Now, and, and another question is that using the bicaline, what, what the pronoun is bicaline, eh? bicaline thing, whatever it is. Yes, bicaline. And then, I noticed this by by Kalin, I think is that it's quite common kan dia punya dia punya dia punya compound tu kan is available uh -huh. kan? like pure by by Kalin kan okay, yes yeah um, why, why, why do you struggle to extract from Beko because uh, there's been a previous uh, study from uh, our team research team when uh, she did uh, uh, use Bakelin, the, the result, the uh, neuroprotective effects are uh, lower than the Bakelin enriched fraction. Probably oh. this uh, this is probably due to there are some some other compounds that synergistically uh, react with the Bakelin itself in the Bakelin enriched fraction. That, that, that's why you extract you you extract from the back core from from the back core. No? Yes. So yes are, they, are, they the... are they different eh, before from the study before? Yes. Like, Okay, All right. That is it. That is my my concern, Lan, because normally, student ataupun researcher when they found it is uh, available to buy, you know, instead of uh -huh. we extract the tons of kilo of beko thing, whatever it is. So why why waste uh, that that again? That, that's mm -hmm. all. So and I've already stuff. done. Uh, I've also done uh, 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 an oxidative BPPH essay on mm -hmm. both. Um, the standard Bakelin that we can buy and this Bakelin and rich fraction, the mm -hmm. oxidation, uh, the oxidative effect uh, is better in the Bakelin and rich fraction. Okay, maybe the answer is a little freshness that thing maybe. Nah? The freshness is oh, maybe important yes, for probably. that thing. Okay, I pass to C2. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I had the same question, but okay. It's about the standard Bakelin and also the extracted Bakelin. Um, mm. I just want to ask a general question. Uh, you started your presentation by introducing this stem cell grafting. Uh, yes. You said that it is a promising uh, treatment, but I don't think it's a conventional treatment yet, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so, so it's not a common treatment for stroke? Mm -hmm. No, not yet. Yes, yeah, it is. Uh, there are some uh, research uh, on the cell, uh, the nearest stem cell grafting, but not many, not that too many. It's 
So it's probably not a conventional method, but still it is a promising that we, we probably should do more research on this. As far as you know, has it been tested on human? Um, so far, I don't, uh, from what I, I have, I know that there's no, still no uh, research on human. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mark, okay. last question, uh, Chairman, uh, Chairperson, can I? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, the ischemic is, is a very much related to high blood pressure, kan? Sorry, sorry. The, the, the ischemic punya, punya condition, ischemic stroke, ni. Uh -huh. it's much uh -huh. related to high blood pressure, kan? Um, oh, yeah. due to the occlusion of blood, kan? Uh -huh. Normally, normally yes. because the high blood pressure lah, dia jadikan ischemic punya outcomes, kan? Uh -huh. What what is the effect of the high blood pressure? Ada study dah. So, sorry, ada. Uh, ada what what is the effect of the high blood pressure? Punya, punya, punya effect. Ada study before. Oh, like, but, but um because my study is uh, more on the neuroprotective effects on the brain cells. Okay, meaning that you punya you punya tu is a neuroprotective lah. It's, it's yes, not, yes, it's not on the ischemic stroke. Not on the on the cause of the ischemic stroke. Ah, oh. uh, I see. Think whatever it is, yeah, lah. Something like that lah. Of course. Tapi ada ada study tak on the high blood pressure? Sorry? Ada study ada study tak before on the high blood pressure before? Um, I'm not really sure about that, doctor. But probably it can. It has something to do with it. Thank you very much, yeah. sir. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Thank you, presenters and judges. So, we have our last presenter. So, let's welcome uh, Susmita Sindu Divans with the code M43 with the, uh, her research title Detections of Cholestine Resistant Escherichia coli Isolated from Broiler Chickens in Clanton. Let's welcome. My name is Susmika Sinodewan. My project title is Detection of Cholestine Resistant E. coli Isolated from Broiler Chickens in Klantan. This project is supervised by Dr. Erki Hun and co-supervised by Prof. Dr. Zunita and also Dr. Ruhil. I am from Faculty of Veterinary Science, University of Malaysia, Klantan. First of all, E. coli is one of the most frequent and versatile infectious microorganisms <laughs> due to its genomic plasticity introduced to the discovery of genetic variability in diverse ecological niches. Recently, the alarming increased rate of antimicrobial resistant strains of E. coli has been documented, and E. coli is considered the excellent indicators of antimicrobial resistance. And it is also have been causing the emergence of multidrug resistance bacterial strain. Antimicrobial resistance or AMR is a global concern in human and veterinary medicine as the antimicrobial agents are widely being used to treat bacterial disease in food production. Inappropriate use of antimicrobial agents and expensive use of animal growth promoters and prophylactic agents in agricultural sectors have been causing the development of the resistance. Escalated risk of developed AMR pathogen transmission from animal to human within the antimicrobial resistant genes have been considered due to the sub-therapeutic dose regimes of antibiotics for bacterial infection, such as chloroquinolones and sulfosporins that were fed at low dosage. The colistine antibiotic is the last resort antimicrobial agent used to treat the multidrug resistant gram negative bacterial infections. The gene encoding colistine resistant is the mobilized colistine resistant MCR genes that are also plasmid bound. Earliest discovery of plasmid mediated MCR1 in Enterobacteriaceae of food animal origin reported in 2015 from China and it is later reported in other countries of South Asia, Africa, Europe, and South America. The drastic emergence of plasmid-mediated MCR1 gene may lead to the ineffectiveness of currently available therapeutic antibiotics and develops the pan drug resistance among the MDR bacteria. The objectives of this project is to detect the colistin resistance in E. coli isolated from broiler chickens in Klantan and also to determine the antibiotic sensitivity patterns of the E. coli isolated from broiler chickens in Klantan. 
Next up is the materials and methods for the sample collection. 320 cloacal swab samples were collected from different broiler poultry farms in Kotabaru, Bacho, Machang, Jeli, Pasipute districts of Klantan. The farms were selected based on the list provided by the Department of Veterinary Services Malaysia. The cloacal swabs were collected with sterile cotton swab with amis transport media. Then the samples were enriched in a primary enrichment media where the swab contents were incubated in Luria Bersani broth for 37 degrees Celsius overnight in a shaking incubator. After sample enrichment, the samples were isolated and identified based on microbiological methods. First of all, they will be cultured on the McConkey agar, where here the colony morphology with dark pink or red, slightly raised, round shaped and 2 to 3 millimeter diameter will be chosen to be subcultured on second McConkey agar. From here, the, the colonies will be cultured on eosin methylene blue agar to show the colony morphology of green metallic sheen appearance, slightly raised, round shape and also 2 to 3 millimeter diameter to, to be considered as a presumptive E. coli isolate. Next is the molecular identification with polymerase chain reaction amplification. The suspected E. coli isolates were processed for DNA extraction. Then they have undergone PCR to, to detect the E. coli species specific gene, which is the 4A gene, and also to detect the collision resistant gene MCR1 among the confirmed E. coli isolates. These are the primers, the primer sequence, and also the PCR protocol used for the 4A gene and also for MCR1 gene. Next is the antibiotic susceptibility testing, where the dis diffusion method was performed with MCR1 positive isolates. Pure colonies of the isolates were diluted in 0.85% of normal slime before being launched on Muller Hinton agar. 12 antibiotics of different clusters have been chosen, and those are the tetracycline, amoxicillin, meropenem, cefotaxim, imipenem, and so on. The zone of inhibition were evaluated based on the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute guidelines. And E. coli ATCC25922 strains were used as negative control. And for the results, based on the isolation and identification method, from 320 cloacal swabs, 121 isolates were detected to be presumptive E. coli, which is about 37.81%. And for molecular identification with PCR, using 4A gene from 121 presumptive E. coli isolates, 91 isolates were and for the which is about 23.0.01%. So based on the AST result on the E. coli isolates with MCR1 gene, which is about 21 isolates, tetracycline have shown the most resistance towards the E. coli isolates, which is 95.24% and followed by chloramphenicol and also sulfur metazole trim tofrim, which is showing 85.71% of resistance, followed by the least resistance of Tazobactam piperacillin, which is about 4.76%, and also the second least uh, resistance showed by the meropenem. So here we can see that antimicrobial resistance have been shown in three different classes, and all isolates showed resistance to at least two, three antibiotics, except for one isolate that showed resistance to astrionam. Therefore, based on the findings, the detection rate of collision resistant genes MCR1 in E. coli isolates are 23.01%. Percent, However, in 2020, Aklilo and Raman reported that 52.1% of the isolates of raw chicken meat origin from Klantan were positive for MCR1 gene, which is double the percentage from our findings. According to the National Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance Reports, Malaysia was in line among the initial countries which showed the emergence of MCR1 gene in Enterobacteriaceae, especially from animal and environment origin isolates. 
And from the findings also, we can find out that resistance to at least three classes of antibiotics indicates that the E. coli isolates are multidrug resistant strains. Next is the 21 colistin resistant isolates was showing the most resistant towards tetracycline, which is about 95.24%. Around 90% rate of tetracycline resistance also were documented from the E. coli isolates retrieved from the East Coast regions of Peninsular Malaysia, revealed by Ibrahim in 2021. More than 70% of the resistance rate were detected from overall review on Southeast Asian countries in 2016. Meanwhile, in Taiyan, China, 2020, 100% of the isolates of MCR1 carrying E. coli were reported as they were carrying tetracycline resistant genes. And the record of 95.25% of tetracycline resistant encoding genes, which is TETA and TETB, respectively, were detected in Bangladesh. So here is the diagram retrieved from the recent study reported in East Coast region of Peninsular Malaysia by Ibrahim in 2021 where here the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance in E. coli isolated from broilers in Kelantan, Terengganu, and Pahang re reported, where tetracycline and sulfamethazole trimotoprim as well as chloramphenicol have been showing higher resistance in Kelantan. And for the re recent study reported in Taiyan, China, they have found out that tetracycline is having the highest uh, resistance genes, which is about 100% containing tetracycline resistant genes, as well as 76% contain sulfonamide resistant genes. The sulfonamides and phenicals classes showed the second most resistance, which is 85.71 percentage towards MCR1 carrying E. coli. The level of both antimicrobial resistance was agreeing with the range of 83 to 85 percentage of previously documented in the East Coast states or in Peninsular Malaysia. At the same time, in Selangor, the resistance of both antibiotics on poultry E. coli isolates were within the range of 77 to 79 percentage. However, Morera in 2021 and Nung in 2016 have claimed that sulfa metaphazole primitofrim were consistently ranking higher level of resistance than chloramphenicols. However, they are both at the higher resistant rate. Meanwhile, for the antibiotic Tazobactam piperacillin, which uh, recorded 4.76% and meropenum recorded 9.52, which is lower than 10% of the resistant rate in our findings. And in Nepal, Tazobactam have recorded 0% and meropenum have recorded 2.6% of lowest resistance among 10 antibiotics, which is uh, tested with MCR1 gene in E. coli isolates from Poultry. In 2016, the NSAR announced that carbapenem rate of resistance remained stable for four years, which was around 0.5% to 0.2% among E. coli strains. However, it is increased now in Kelantan. As the last generation antibiotics of the broad spectrum beta lactams, resistance was developed by the adaptation mechanism of producing carbapenemesis, as well as the biofilm production that facilitate its dissemination extensively. Therefore, in conclusion, the transmission of resistant isolates need to be seriously driven low to reduce the load of multidrug resistance. However, the difference in fractions of antibiotic resistance selection with the presence of MCR1 gene is unexpected. Therefore, major surveillance of multidrug resistant bacteria and colistin resistant need to be implemented worldwide to generate the database and knowledge that will be used for the optimization of future treatments and also advanced alternative antimicrobial agents. So these are the references used. And thank you. So thank you, presenter. Let's proceed with the Q&A sessions. Over the charges. Uh, Sumita. Yeah. Is Doctor uh, can hear me? Can you hear me, Prof? Yeah, yeah very, very clear. Okay. Clear. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Smita. It's quite, 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 quite good, good trend or study that I, that that you you are you are shown to us. It's okay. my question. Uh, is quite. Uh, what is the what is the what you call it? Uh, the condition. Is it the alarming condition, or actually we are still in under control, or is it still okay with the AMR in Malaysia? 
uh, when it comes to the colistin, uh, we are still out, uh, we are we already have the MCR in Malaysia, mm -hmm. which is reported before, but it is not at, at the alarming rate yet. If considered oh, how, in Malaysia, how, 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 how long we can sustain that? Uh, <laughs> because uh, for now in Asia, it has been widely reported. Reported that in uh, MCR one is one of the most uh, reported uh, cholesterol genes mm -hmm. and when compare uh, when we, we see for other studies this uh, one study have reported that we have mcr3 but that one is in uh, pig origins so right now we are still uh, do not have a proper data on the cholesterol resistant gene in Malaysia on your expertise based on your expertise or your observation and your study mm -hmm. thing these this am are problems uh, regarding what? to the Sorry, this, these AMR problems, okay, this mm -hmm. is number uh, related to the this uh, broiler is the farmer's thing, whatever it is. The mm -hmm. problem is the with the antibiotic itself, the pathogens, or with the farmer's 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 practice. Uh, the farmer's practice is one of the reason that they are having because they have been using growth promoters and uh, for the broiler chickens. And they have been using these antibiotics for all this while. But uh, for now, colistin is actually banned for the poultry industry. But still, mm -hmm. we can find that uh, they are having the collision resistance in the poultry industry. Scary, eh? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, C2. I passed to C2. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, seems like you have asked my question. I was also <laughs> wanted to ask. Um, can you suggest like the best practice for the farmers to control antibiotic resistance? Um, e. coli? For e. coli, okay. For this, actually, they have been, they should be controlling the antibiotic usage. They should not be using them like, uh, they actually, we have to educate the farmers properly by uh, giving, uh, Telling them what are the schedules that we should be giving, uh, giving the poultry uh, in the poultry industries, uh, and then how much regimes that we should be giving and all that. So they need to be educated much more. Uh, they are educated, but we need to educate more on the resistance. What is the importance of the antimicrobial resistance and all? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you presenters. And we have come to the end of our session. Thank you to the all presenters, or can I say future scholar for your participations and cooperation. And special acknowledgement goes to the panel of judges for evaluating the research presentation. And we are truly sorry for the technical issue uh, uh, from the start and we will improve for tomorrow. So before we end the session, May I request all the participants and judges to switch on the camera for a visual photography session? Okay, all participants can turn uh, switch on your camera. So sit at your best position. Nampak kai mas tu senyum lebih lebih sikit. So to all non presenters also you can switch on your camera. Okay, our PI is ready, I guess. All right, with the count of three, I'll start taking picture here. So three, two, one, smile. All right, another shot. Three, two, one, smile. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, everyone. So before you leave our virtual room, I would like to remind that all participants are required to join the second day of e-symposium, which begins at 8.30 a.m. And for your information, we have three plenary speech sessions closing remarks and prize giving ceremony. So besides, uh, lastly, we kindly request you to fill in the feedback form via the link provided in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you judges and may the best one win. Thank you everyone. Thank you. <laughs>